uh, from India. Uh, I'm editor-in-chief of Center for Investigative Journalism, which is, a, you can say, a pioneering institute in a country where we have 70,000 newspapers and a one center for investigative journalism. And the center works under the Data Leads, which is again a startup, a three-year-old company, which I founded after working for about 17 years as a journalist, covering mostly security and national security issues, because my sense was that the journalism is changing. And in a country where we have a one billion plus population, people were available for it, uh, you can say, to access content on a different levels and different platforms, which the legacy media was not offering them in, say, in 2012 and 10. And my, my understanding has been uh, the journalism, actually, the fundamental challenge we are facing. I don't know if we're having the presentation here. It's not working, so let's start like this way. So, so that if, Mary, can I quickly make my statement, or should I just give an introduction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. wonderful, okay. So, uh, my understanding has been that as, as a journalist who worked for like 17, 16 years, mostly in Asian countries, I reported from almost like 43 countries as a young reporter. I think the fundamental challenge of journalism has been that the journalists are not really willing to experiment or build crowd beyond their own community. Like even in this room, for example, we're talking about data, we're talking about a lot of issues, and we're all journalists in this room, mostly, on journalism editorial side. So what I personally felt, in, say in 2012, 2013, that in order to reach out to more people or build new models of journalism or storytelling or identify the new spaces available, we need to meet and build collaboration with non-journalists. So what we did actually was that we took some 20 medical doctors and 20 journalists in a remote part of India. And we thought like doctors will never come because they have their own world, you know, they're, they're busy people. So they will not come for a, you can say for data boot camp where they're meeting journalists. But to our surprise, nine in the morning and the room was completely occupied by the doctors and journalists were still coming one by one. So that initiative actually became a pan-Asia initiative. And in the last three years, we did similar boot camps in which we had medical doctors, journalists, data scientists in 11 countries. So we did boot camps starting from India, Maldives, Nepal, Bangladesh, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand twice, Indonesia. So it created a community of around a couple of thousand people who were journalists, data scientists, and medical doctors. And that created a lot of space for us as a small company, as a startup. One, to do the reporting, and then second, we had a ready audience, because all these people who came to our boot camps were not really the journalist journalists, they were half of the crowd, but the rest half were medical doctors, scientists, and they had their own communities. So that meant actually that we were able to reach millions of people by this small network we're building in some Asian countries. So I think the, one of the challenges was that instead of talking to each other as a journalist, we need to find new community in order to identify audience, in order to identify revenue also, and in order to find also the engagement at a different level. So my question, uh, which is a, I see the, uh, the challenge statement for today, how do we do that? How can we build a collaboration? I, I remember Reuters, for example, acquired companies uh, in Delhi, which was a legal, uh, which was actually four lawyers and a journalist coming together. And they said, because India had a huge data set, legal matters available in the Supreme Court. Like you will be surprised to know that we have a Freedom of Information Act, which is just 10 years old. And every year, we file 4 million applications. And out of 4 million applications, 3.9 application, million applications are answered by the government with the data. So that means 3.9 million stories in a year. So, th so there's a different levels of collaboration which we can do, actually. So my challenge, actually, is to identify, along with you today, how can we build collaboration, say, with lawyers? Say with medical doctors, say with scientists. I remember Chuck Lewis, a good friend of ours in the US, he was a pioneer in terms of starting a collaboration between hardcore scientists and journalists as a part of fellowship. 
But can we build a business model around it where we just give a very high end content to a particular audience and create a subscription, membership, whatever content model around it? And if we do that, what are the ultimate opportunities available when we do that? What are the challenges? What are the pitfalls? And what are the opportunities? I think mostly that's what we're going to discuss when we meet in the different groups. Can we do that? And why is that a sustainable model of storytelling? I think I'm done with that. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Hi, everyone, and welcome. And it's really nice to be in here and part of the data journalism as well. So I'm com coming from Istanbul. Uh, I'm teaching data journalism so, since 2014 in the University of Kadehas. And I am also co-founder of data journalism platform called DAG Media, Dark Media. And I also co-founder with seven people. It calls, uh, it's a non-profit called Open Data and Data Journalism Association in Turkey. Um, I think I did more than now 100 activities and events in Turkey about data journalism, open data, data literacy, and I also created some sort of um, MOOC, it's first time in Turkey. So my topics today is how we can really teach data journalism in universities and faculties better. And it's, uh, we have lots of challenges, actually locally uh, we have challenges, but also in internationally I can also see a lot of interesting problems behind. Okay, still we are teaching journalism and still very important to tell story, but Data journalism presents new challenges. And what it is, for, from my point, it's um, we are always upskilling, so need to new skills all the time while we teach data journalism. So, and especially lecturers at university, you, you have a time limited, overload work, and also it's uh, the short academic period, it's not really helping us to really teach or really do enough practice. This is one challenge actually in front of us all the time. The other one is, um, sorry, I think it's, I'm not sure my presentation on screen because my, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. And well, so the other one actually is about practice. Okay, of course we need to practice. We teach the students, but is it also important for instructors or academics understand how to produce data journalism project. So what I do when I teach data journalism, I give the students firstly solo projects or group projects, but I also pick a project and I also create the project together with students. So it's really challenging for us to understand what is the basic problems behind the creating project sometimes. So it's important for us to really do practice more while we're teaching. It's not really... Uh, just talk and not showing anything. So it's really important challenge for us as well. So the other one is actually we have, as I said, it's really 15 weeks. Seems like really very long, but it's not actually. Sometimes four or five weeks is just like uh, exams, etc. But it's really we need long-term data journalism curriculum and teaching all the basics and fundamentals. Especially in, in my country, in Turkey, we really, I do teach very basic sometimes, because if the students don't know Excel, and it's really a problem for us, so it's, you need to really understand the basics and background of the students. So this is a really challenge, another challenge. And of course, and if there is no enough um, lecture in your faculty, and you can't really hire, hire some um, experts, so it's also a problem. So there's no really funding models to bring some experts into your newsroom, uh, into your faculty. This is also our problem and challenges. And of course, students itself, uh, themselves as well, because sometimes uh, students not really paying enough attention when, they are, when you're teaching them data journalism. So you, you really need, need to make them understand whole story. So we need to go back to just remind them this data journalism is all about journalism. I know, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, maybe you did hear from different data journalism platforms, but really sharing them, this is all about the telling stories, it's really important. So I will go quick. Um, so how we can solve it, like how we can really do, I don't know what my time is running or not, yeah. it's time? Okay, my time is run, but it's, I'm going to share basically and dive that, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Hello, um, thank you for being here with us all. I think um, other, unlike other data journalism panels, we are really looking towards our audience for solutions. Um, my name is Eva Constanteris, and my job is basically to go to developing countries and set up data journalism teams within media houses. So the idea is that if you give voiceless, uneducated, oppressed populations access to data-driven journalism, um, it will promote equality, it will promote the democratic process, um, and it will ensure equality within that country. So I've done that in Afghanistan, um, in Pakistan, and Kenya. Um, and basically, I'm, I'm here to talk about how it's time to do that in the West. Um, most Western data journalism is by a bunch of white men, about a bunch of white middle class people, and is consumed by a bunch of upper middle class white people, um, which seemed fairly harmless um, until Brexit and the US elections when we realized that in fact it's not just educated white people who vote, and if all of our data journalism is about polling results of white people and not about the underlying issues um, that are preventing development, that are keeping minority populations from getting education, that are quashing economic opportunities, if people don't have access to that kind of quality public interest journalism, um, they're gonna vote for the white guy who's going to keep their situation um, exactly as it was. So. Basically, what I'm here to talk about is that these issues, injustice, discrimination, inequality, um, these are insidious problems, they're ubiquitous problems, um, and they're overlooked. They're not in the media every day, um, and, they, and they need to be. So I, my challenge is how do we get marginalized communities producing data journalism um, one major challenge is there is not a lot of data about these groups. Um, probably you saw the BBC piece about pay the gender gap um, and the Guardian piece about the gender gap in the UK. Um, you've probably read articles about gerrymandering in the US to keep black people from voting. Um, these are stories that need to be told by the communities that are impacted. So one challenge we have is how do we get more marginalized voices to produce data journalism in the newsroom? How do we get more data about these groups? LGBT groups, um, oppressed populations all over the world, are, they're, they're not being counted. There is not a lot of data about them. So how do we generate more data about them? And then how do we get these stories to them? Most marginalized communities in the US do not read the New York Times. Most marginalized communities in the UK do not read The Guardian. In Germany, they do not read Der Spiegel. And those are, that is where data journalism is being produced. So how do we disseminate data journalism through media that reaches marginalized communities so they're actually voting based on policy and what is going to be good for their communities um, and their populations? So my challenge for you is how do we get more marginalized communities to produce data journalism, to collect data, and to consume data journalism. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Duncan Clark. I used to be uh, an environment journalist at The Guardian. That got me into data and then I got into doing data visualization with a company called Kiln that I set up about five years ago. Um, and that led to the thing we've been doing for the last couple of years which is called Flourish, um, which I'll come back to at the, in, a, in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, so I want to start by saying there is loads of amazing interactive and visual journalism out there. Um, and I couldn't agree more that it's very much on a particular side of the political spectrum, on the, the demographic spectrum. But, um, but there's loads of good stuff happening. Um, we're about to see the reveal of the data journal, the, the award shortlist, which will no doubt be um, full of great stuff. And there's a lot of um, tapping on the back about that. And um, we just heard one reason why maybe we need to be a bit cautious about that. I want, I want to just point to a couple of others. Um, I want to just touch on three problems that 
uh, are really about workflow as much as anything, about how we're um, in newsrooms all around the world, um, maybe not being quite as smart about um, interactive journalism as, as we could be. So one, uh, all the formatting's gone on this uh, import into PowerPoint, so ignore that, but um, the first problem is that it's very, very difficult to do interactive journalism. It's, it's, it's a very small number of devs who can do it, and that excludes not only a great deal of data literate, talented journalists who just don't happen to be expert D3 coders, but it also entire newsrooms, especially in the developing world, um, but not only in the developing world, um, regional press, etc. There's a lot of newsrooms who just don't have the capacity to do interactive journalism even though they want to. Um, the second problem is that it takes so long to do interactive journalism well. I mean, when we look through the, uh, the shortlist um, reveal soon, I, you know, if you were to add up the number of hours spent on those projects, it would run into the millions, I don't doubt, because it takes a huge amount of time to produce stuff from scratch. And what that means is that even when you do have interactive developers on your newsroom team, then you probably don't get as much produced as, as you'd really like to. Um, and then the third problem is that we have a tendency in the news sector to always be reinventing the wheel. And um, by that I mean that there are a huge number of hours spent creating from scratch the same fundamental um, visualizations, for example. But this, uh, you know, this runs across everything from, um, from basic charts through to uh, you know, really fancy interactive stories. Um, a lot of projects are basically the same under the hood, but the code isn't really reused. And, um, and I think that feels a bit wasteful. Especially you know, if you're a, um, sitting in a small newsroom in Mexico, say, and you see a nice Sankey diagram on um, the Guardian site, and you think, well, we might want to do something like that for our election results, um, then it's really frustrating that the way that you handle, um, the way that that reuse is possible is only by seeing who made it, contacting them, seeing if the code's open source. Even if it is open source, then it's probably only available on a GitHub repo, which if you happen to be a coder, you can download and run, if you can work out how it works. Um, and you're basically effectively going to be um, back to reading D3 documentation and, and starting from scratch. Um, so what do we need to do to improve this? Sorry, this typographic crime over here. But um, what do we need to do to improve the situation? So I mean, that's really the purpose of the discussion today. And I don't um, want to su suggest that um, it's really obvious, because these are hard problems to solve. But um, two things, I think, are that we need um, easy to use but flexible tools. So a lot of newsrooms now are building their own um, visualization tools. I say a lot, probably only a dozen or two. Um, and the reason that, that it's not a larger number is that maintaining software is hard, building software is hard. Um, if making visualizations is hard, making good tools is even harder. Um, and often when you do make t uh, tools, you have this massive trade-off with flexibility. So you end up being able to do certain things really easily, but you can't do anything else. Um, the other thing that could be improved if we can think of creative ways to do it are to find better ways to have to allow newsrooms, especially smaller ones that don't have the big interactive teams, to share and reuse projects, by which I don't just mean saying, oh, I'll stick this on GitHub and, and say it's under an MIT license, but actually enabling that sharing in a, in a practical way. Um, so I've only got about five seconds left, but um, those are kind of the two problems that we've been trying to solve with Flourish. I, I was going to do a little demo, but I think we've run out of time. Um, and uh, so maybe I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll raise that in the discussion. Okay. All right, we're back on track. Okay, so I have something for you. Up. Now, what are we going to do now? Here's the process of um, the rest of this session. Basically, we've just heard from our four speakers about the challenges that they'd like to tackle with you today. Um, now we're going to try and hear from a few of you to see what you think, how you relate to uh, those topics we've just heard about. Um, and then we split the room into four groups to get cracking and have a chat about those specific topics. Um, these chats are going to take 
just about 20 minutes long, I think. It's a very like a sprinty kind of chat. <laughs> and at the same time, we have the magnificent Simon Rogers, uh, data editor at the Google News Lab and also director of the Data Journalism Awards competition, who is um, chatting live on Slack right now. So uh, you're not alone. <laughs> there are other people from other countries in remote locations um, trying to take part in this discussion and um, chatting with us as well, which is great. Um, at the end of those discussions, we'll aim, aim for each of those groups to um, delegate somebody to catch up um, everybody else on what was said and the kind of solutions you may have discussed during those discussions. And that will be the end of our session where we will reveal the, the shortlist of the Data Journalism Awards 2018 competition, which is quite very exciting. So right now, we're going to hear from some amazing people, right, in the room. They are among you. Um, who are going to tell us what, what discussion they are picking. So I'm going to put a recap of the four discussions right here. And I think that Jane, right, are you ready to help us? You volunteered to come and, and speak because um, you relate quite a bit about this collaborative um, challenge that Said just talked about. Do you want to tell us a bit more? Sure. So um, I am Jane Barrett. I am at Reuters. I'm the global head of multimedia. Um, and as you probably know, Reuters has been investing a lot in data journalism and data visualization over the last few years. And we've really been doing exactly what Syed was saying about um, collaborating with experts. So into three main areas. Um, one, uh, as expert data gatherers, there are many, many people out there who have a lot of data and their data piles are just building up and they don't really know what to do with them. Um, and they are very keen for journalists to come in and find the story in the data. And that's where our expertise can help. Um, secondly, then, uh, with statisticians and computer scientists. So um, we did a series a couple of years ago um, on the US Supreme Court called the Echo Chamber. And there was, there was 10,000 cases that we had to go through. So you can imagine that if a journalist had to go through 10,000 cases, um, it would take several years, by which time there'd probably be another 2,000 cases to go through. Um, and actually, what our data journalism team in the US did was to find somebody else in Thomson Reuters who was an expert at topic modeling. And so he helped them to create um, a machine learning program um, to run through all of those 10,000 um, and, and find, find the story. Um, and essentially, it allowed us to find that there are 66 elite lawyers um, who come before the Supreme Court more than anyone else. They are successful, uh, sorry, more than three quarters of the time, they represent big business against the little person. Uh, they account for less than 1% of the lawyers who, who um, present at the Supreme Court. Um, are they're involved in 43% of the cases and that they, two thirds of the time, they won. So it basically showed that big business was gaming the system with these 66 lawyers in order to get um, their, their cases through. So that's just one, one example. We also work with a professor at the University of Alabama, James Cochran, um, who's been helping us with lots of statistical techniques that are changing themselves, right? So um, we've been working on uh, some, some regression analysis, um, uh, some propensity score matching to show that the, if you apply for asylum in the States, it's really, really random as to whether you get it. It just depends on who your case comes in front of. Um, we also have done some antibiotic um, uh, investigations around the, da the data and actually lack of data around antibiotic resistance um, with him. And one of the interesting things, and Syed was, was mentioning this before, is that there's a huge appetite outside of journalism for data journalism. And I think, you know, in a, in a time where we're short of money, we're, we're short of resources, then why on earth would we not collaborate with people outside of journalism to get their expertise, to get some of their funding, um, to, to break news. And what we found is that those experts aren't journalists. And James Cochran, for example, actually now invites our guys to go to conferences with him because he's like, well, this is great. We've got all this data. 
but I've always been anal analysing what was in the past, and you guys are using your journalistic skills to throw it forward and to affect change from the data. So it's a really um, interesting area that I think we should be exploring a lot more. Thank you. Cheers. Um, um, another person who came forward and, and said they, they wanted to get involved is Lucas. We have Lucas Pavlovsky from Microsoft. Um, you, because of the stuff you do at Microsoft and um, more specifically around data journalism, are very much related to uh, the stuff that Duncan spoke about earlier, right? That's right. Yeah, thank you very much, Marianne, for the introduction. So my name is Wukash Pavlovsky. I'm a program manager on the Power BI team over at Microsoft. We build data tools that enable people to make business decisions. But at least about two years ago, we started getting requests from journalists to say, how can they use those same kinds of tools that are really focused on productivity, the easy way to create charts, the easy way to create interactives, to further reporting. And so we started this journey over two years of taking reporters who traditionally just write text or present in front of a broadcast environment and helping them create their own interactives uh, in using our tools. And it's actually opened our eyes to how those tools can actually help in very much in the spirit of what Duncan was in, saying in the, in the challenge because there's a number of things that affect journalists today. Number one is there's small newsrooms. In fact, they quite often get much smaller. The people that do data journalism are very technical. They know D3. They know the very technical data science-y things. But there's so many more people in the newsroom who could be doing data journalism but don't know how. Uh, more importantly, it's also about how journalists interact with their audience. It's not true to say that a journalist tells the whole story in any given article. There's many stories in that article. And oftentimes, the story arc in that article presents one aspect supported by several different anecdotes that, that drive that. But within the community, there's much more of this story. So how do you get from that one piece of data that the journalist decided to talk about and present it. So one thing that we've been doing is we've been doing a collaboration with the Associated Press. Because while Duncan you know, mentioned small newsrooms have this challenge, even large newsrooms also have this challenge. And so the Associated Press has a data team. It's a small team. But have many, many reporters. How do those reporters, when they're doing a story like on African American home ownership and the impact of the financial crisis in 2008 on home ownership rates through the years 2010 and through 2015, how do they tell that story but empower their members because Associated Press creates content for their members. Those members are local members. They're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're in Albany, New York. How do they empower them to do data journalism? Those smaller publications, they don't actually have a data team potentially. How do those people do it? So what, with the Associated Press, what we did was we started a pilot program where they started distributing uh, content in our format, which is a Power BI format. And then the newsrooms were able to go and customize that using our easy-to-use tools. And so we had stories such as in, in Albany, Georgia, for example, the home ownership rate actually of African Americans increased by 16%, as opposed to the national trend that decreased by 20% in that same period. Empowers those journalists in that local market to find a relevant story and present it out to their audience. So as, a, as we approach this question of how do you build tools for the newsroom? I think there's also an important aspect of how do you build tools or provide content in a way that engages the broader community and then reflects back so that reporters can take in those stories and uh, communicate them out, amplify them. A couple of examples from this conference, right? So I think uh, Yusuf Omar did a fantastic presentation on how to empower through teaching social media uh, to uh, various uh, disaffected groups in various parts of the world. He showed how to train them, how to create Facebook Live videos and present their reality. And then that gets amplified through the, real, through the larger established media to tell that story. Similarly, projects that are big projects like the Panama Papers that empowered information into the broad community. And you know, the, the, the big publishers created stories about the top names, you know, Queen Elizabeth appeared in the Panama Papers, so therefore, et cetera, and so on. But the trickle-down effect of that was that local papers could find the local politicians who use the same techniques and could hold them to account. So how do you go and build systems, not only just for newsrooms, to be able to work effectively, create more stories? 
how to create, how to collaborate within newsrooms, across newsrooms, but also how to collaborate with the broader public and then help them find the stories and then communicate back. Thank you. Cheers. Um, we had uh, another person, that's Terry, who came forward. Because Terry, you, you're quite close to this topic about marginalized group being represented in data journalism. Can you tell us a bit more about you and why? Sure. Hi, I'm Terry Walter. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Chartbeat. Uh, Chartbeat works with many of you uh, in the audience to help understand how stories are resonating with people. Um, I'm really interested in Ava's topic uh, because we, we measure how stories are resonating um, and our top stories show that marginalized voices are being heard. For example, Alex Tizan's story about modern day slavery was the number one story um, as per Chartbeat um, last year. Um, but understanding what's getting mass readership is not good enough. Um, we, we talk to a lot of journalists around the world, in Uruguay, in Peru, in Ecuador, in Latin America, um, in Nigeria, um, and then also in the US, um, in, in, in Europe, in terms of, um, you know, if people are asking us if there was something Chartbeat could do to help understand stories that haven't been told yet. You know, are there signals, is there encouragement that could come from the platform um, that could really help uncover stories that still need to be told? Um, so we're looking at doing product development um, in trying to understand what is it that we could be doing, what tools, what training, um, uh, could we be doing to help the community? Um, right now, we're, um, we're just starting a project that looks at gender sourcing um, in the news um, to, to look at ways that our, um, um, our data infrastructure um, could help the community um, identify bias um, in sourcing, um, particularly male, female, but could that be used? Uh, could content um, analysis um, and um, tagging um, be ways that we can understand uh, number of articles that, you know, that we can quantify what is actually, what stories are being told and what stories aren't being told. So I'm interested in uh, contributing to this group. Um, would love to brainstorm with all of you on what tools and technologies, what training um, could we be thinking about now um, to empower marginalized communities. Thank you, thank you. And so the, the last topic, um, for today um, is brought by Pina and how to better teach data journalism skills um, in schools and universities. And so how could you relate to that topic and why would you take part in this discussion? Simon Rogers is going to come forward and tell us. Hi everyone. So my name is Simon Rogers. I'm the data editor at the Google News Lab. I also teach uh, data journalism at the Medill um, School in San Francisco one, one morning a week. And even though we work on a lot of tools, and my team builds a lot of tools and works on tools for data journalists, when I'm teaching, I don't actually teach tools that much. What I do do when we talk about tools is really about what they can do for you. Because I think a lot of data journalism can fall into this trap of worrying so much about the technology we forget about the people, the people out there who are going to consume what we're doing and how to tell a story. And the first time I taught data journalism, I, was, uh, I, was, I had a group of incredibly bright students. None of them knew how to pick up the phone or talk to a person, or how to sell a story to a news editor. You know, how to explain a data story to somebody who's really got five seconds to listen to you. I think those skills feel to me to be really important. The skills of journalism applied, applied to data journalism, I think is a kind of a, a never ending thing that we need to remember. And that's what really interests me, how to bring that humanity um, into the work that we do and think about what you're doing as journalism, it's not just creating an interactive or just creating visualization or just showing the world how clever you are, right? It's about making people understand the story that you're trying to tell. So that's what I care about. Great. Thank you. All right. So you've heard about the four topics, right, in different ways. Now it's time for us to split the room into four groups. So what I suggest is that our lovely speakers just uh, spread around in the room. Luckily, we can easily manage to uh, for each of you to have like a corner of the room and uh, pick your corner, basically. Go for it. So what we will aim in terms of timing is that right now it's 12.40. So let's say that by five past one, 
we should all gather back together. So, go ahead, guys. Uh, pick the topic that you're the more interested in and uh, go to the corner of the room where we are dealing with it. And um, remember that after the, the 20 minute, 25 minutes or so discussion, we should all get back together and catch up on what was said in each of the topics. So if you feel like you'd like to attend all of them, it's fine to choose <laughs> and you'll hear about it later. It's okay to move the chairs. It's okay to stand up if you prefer. Freestyle. All right, so the discussion on teaching data journalism is happening at the back over there. The discussion about marginalized group is just here at the front on my left side. Duncan is taking the this side of the stage to talk about data visualizations. And finally, collaborative work, how to better collaborate with experts when you're a data journalist is right at the bottom over there near the translation booth. Hey, hey guys. Just giving you a five minutes warning. That's when we're gonna get back together and have a chat about what you're all talking about right now, right? Think about the person you wanna bring on stage to say a recap of what you've talked about. All right. Whoa, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Should we all get back together? I hope you guys had good chats and discussions and that this was enjoyable and fascinating and a great, I don't know, learning curve, was it? <laughs> That's the key word. Um, all right, should we all try and get back together and have a chat about what happened? Um, the good thing is that if you think you were right in the middle of a discussion that should last three hours, it's okay, because um, after this uh, session, we will continue chatting about these four topics um, on the Data Journalism Awards Slack team, and um, soon, uh, next week, we will publish articles with the outcomes of your discussions, right? So this is not the end, it is just the beginning. Um, I didn't get a chance to do that earlier in the session, but we'd like to say thank you to um, those organizations that are helping us putting this together today, right? Um, thanks Charbit, thanks Microsoft, and thanks Reuters for uh, putting this event together with us. Give you a minute to put your chairs back in place and we'll get cracking. All right. How was it? How was it, guys? All right? Okay. Who wants to go first? Should we just take it in order? We got folks who talked about visualizations. Duncan, in your group, who wants to stand up and tell us? What, what did you chat about? What kind of ideas did you come up with? Did you, did you actually find answers to those questions? Do you want to give us a little catch up? Just, just a few minutes. We failed to pick anyone to, to, uh, to feed back, so we don't have any notes or anything. But um, so the things that came up were the importance of, um, of training, and even when the good tools are available, people don't necessarily know which ones are suitable for them in their particular sort of team size and their particular level of expertise. Um, uh, we touched on the kind of inherent trade-off between tools that are more powerful and tools that are more easy to use. Um, we, the thing came up about it being a risk for journalists to ever use tools which may in the longer run not work on their website. Um, and so it, the importance of being able to own the, the, the output. Um, 
Uh, we didn't really get to the bottom of the thing I was trying to scratch away at there, which is how do you get devs in newsrooms to contribute to the sort of a, a greater good community, not just in a traditional open source way, but in a specific reusability kind of way. Um, and obviously that's what we're trying to do with Flourish, but it, for that to really work, we need to find a way to get as many devs um, into it as well as non-coders. Did I miss anything? Good, okay, thank you, thank you. Hey. Um, all right, Heva's team, where are you at? You're here. <laughs> Who wants to talk? Can you give us your name, please? Uh, yes, I'm Lexi. Um, I am a journalism student um, studying abroad, and I'm from the States. So one thing we wanted to talk about were how data journalists um, are a lot of times from minority groups, and this can make it hard for um, the rest of the world to kind of get involved and like understand. As well, um, there's like a lot of marginalization that occurs. Um, as Ava had mentioned, it's a lot of middle class people usually writing for middle, um, middle class people and um, it's hard to intertwine the data, data journalists with people of minority groups such as LGBT or from lower socioeconomic status. So that's really what we're trying to, we're trying to involve data journalists um, data journalism into the marginalized sectors. Um, a problem that arises is it takes a lot of um, specif specified education that's also like expensive, so that makes it harder for people to become data journalists and then to get that correct info out. Um, okay. Ava, did you want to um, add to that? <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that kind of addresses the how do we get more minority voices into the newsroom. So lower education requirements don't make people have an expensive degree um, to be hired, do more in-house training, um, which was a suggestion from Martin. Um, recruit from academ other academic fields and from advocacy groups who maybe don't realize that their message um, would be enhanced by reaching um, a larger group of people. Um, to deal with the lack of available data about marginalized communities. Uh, we talked about um, partnering with CSOs that do collect data um, on those communities and doing projects together. Um, we also talked about being a little bit more comfortable uh, crowdsourcing data um, and setting up sort of experiments to collect data um, directly about these groups. Um, and then finally on how do we get um, more marginalized communities to consume um, data stories. One thing we talked about was um, basically going really local. So pushing data out um, through um, local, very local, hyper-local media for either really specific targeted um, content um, relevant to them, um, often using maybe data sources like ProPublica or, or other groups that are collecting nationwide data but at a sub-regional level. Um, so those were kind of our suggestions for how to increase um, consumption um, of data journalism by marginalized groups. Great, thank you. Mm, a lot came out, right? Yeah, finally? Okay. Hi. Can you tell us who you are? Hi, I'm Just speak really in it. Oh, wow. Okay, so hi, I'm Elisabetta. I work for the BBC. Uh, and uh, uh, with our group, we have been trying to um, cover the topic of uh, how to best teach uh, data journalism in schools and universities. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the uh, topics uh, uh, which I found more interesting was how to keep uh, the students interested into data journalism and not be daunted by Excel files during the first weeks. And I think that a PNR approach is uh, very inspiring in that uh, he, uh, she is encouraging uh, uh, each student to work on a solo project uh, and she is guiding them uh, through the process. Uh, so, you know, which is the story, what is the angle, what kind of sources, uh, what is that data journalism can give to the story uh, that no other approach can give and so on. But uh, uh, she was underlying the importance of giving students freedom in the choice of topic. They need to pick something they care about, whether it's football or cats or whatever so that uh, they can feel motivated uh, through the process. 
other aspects we were touching on were uh, the importance of uh, making them aware of the sources out there, what kind of sources and uh, open source, how to co uh, cooperate, how to uh, do the freedom of information uh, um, requests, uh, what are the alternatives if, if that should not work. And then uh, we were talking about how uh, important it is to keep the curriculum up to date and uh, with the new tools, whatever new things that the journalism is offering at the moment. Yeah, okay. that's about it, unless you want to add something. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think this is all worth a round of applause. Like, <laughs> congratulations, everyone, for having those. Sorry? Oh, Syed, so oh, my poor Syed. Where are you sitting? Oh, you're sitting on the corner over there. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Apologies. Apologies, sorry. <laughs> Yes, please tell us, tell us. Okay, so, you see, um, collaboration. so I'm Gianpaolo Cardo from European Data Journalism Network. So we came out uh, on our topic with nine challenges and unfortunately only five uh, solutions or opportunities. Uh, the biggest challenge that came out, at least the first, is language, uh, in the sense that uh, often data journalists and experts don't speak the same language uh, because every each of them has its own kind of uh, specific language and often they don't speak the same language in the sense that they don't come from the same country. So ch language is uh, the first one. The second uh, challenge is the working habits. Uh, journalists and scientists don't have the same working habits and they even don't have the same, they don't live in the same time capsule often. So th this might lead to, to some friction. Third challenge is time, uh, because newsrooms have time constraints and scientists have other type of time constraints and often they don't match. So time must be, um, uh, I mean, uh, time is definitely uh, a challenge and also it takes time to adapt uh, what scientists are producing to a journalistic language which is understandable for the public. The fourth uh, challenge is uh, while working with non-journalists uh, represents a huge burden sometimes for journalists because of the challenge one, two, and three. Uh, everything that the scientists don't take into account must be taken into account by journalists in terms of work, adaptation, translation, and so on. Uh, the fifth challenge is often that <laughs> neither uh, the experts and the journalists know why they are working together or what's the, the ultimate goal of their collaboration. And this, the goal must be very clear since the beginning so that they can go into the, the same direction. Uh, and they also, they also need to build a methodology which is shared among them. Sixth challenge is our ego issues. Sometimes uh, scientists <laughs> tend to, uh, w they want to be in the first place um, and also journalists. So this can lead to, uh, to some problem. The seventh challenge is, oh gosh, I, I write really badly. Uh, Okay, let, let's go to the, the later. Uh, a challenge is how to communicate uh, the result of the outcome in a way which is effective and which can lead to some uh, effective change into policies or into the life of citizen. And uh, the ninth challenge is you need a platform to, uh, to collaborate. You need some tools and they need to be effective, easy to use and not to be uh, a, s a supplementary burden on your everyday uh, work. I hope I've uh, summarized it well. But there are, there are also opportunities when, uh, when you face challenging, challenges and when you want to collaborate. Have you actually managed to find answers to those nine challenges in to 25 so, minutes? Sorry? <laughs> Have you actually managed to answer tho those nine challenges in 25 minutes? Yeah, the number minutes? seven is still uh, <laughs> quite unclear, but maybe, maybe some archaeologists will uh, decipher it. So when it comes to opportunities, the first one is you got more accurate content. If you bring in experts and scientists, it will be definitely more accurate than if you leave it only to journalists. And this is a big opportunity in times of fake news. <laughs> I said it, sorry. I, I will put my Keyword. one year into the box. Yeah. Uh, second opportunity is that when uh, you, you bring in experts, the distribution of the, the news that you will be making will be more broad because they will distribute it within their own community. Uh, the other uh, opportunity is that your audience will expand because you will have more content of quality. The fourth opportunity is that you will build a community 
uh, around the experts that you will have brought around you on specific topics. And that community would last if it finds uh, a useful stake uh, in the work you're doing. The fifth and last opportunity is that you will develop uh, people's interest into topics which they were not interested before, maybe like, uh, like health issues, like climate change issues, and those specific interests will lead to new business models, niche business models for uh, setting up new media on those specific issues. Uh, I think that's it. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, cheers everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So as you, you may have noticed, right, I get two mics now. <laughs> um, we have a camera at the back of the room, right? So that session is recorded, which is a great news for us because we want to make stuff out of this session, um, including articles about the outcome of what you've talked about. So these little um, two, three minutes catch-ups were actually really useful for what's going to come later, right? So that we can compile everything and, and move on with those discussions. Um, okay, so um, that was quite uh, fun, unusual, as planned, and not as planned as well. So <laughs> we was really glad to, to be here with you today. And uh, as promised, we have something special to share with you today. Um, and... Uh, that is um, probably the, the biggest step in the process of the Data Journalism Awards competition this year. Um, we are still live on Slack with uh, Mr. Rogers here, uh, sharing information with our community here. Um, but uh, because um, we, we're friends now, <laughs> we wanted to also give you um, um, a look um, into what's been happening in the competition. So let me click and make this work. <laughs> no, it does work. There we go. Well, for the people who worked on the, um, the discussion around uh, visualization with Duncan, you may recognize the interface of Flourish that we've used uh, for those visualizations. Um, so we had to talk about the Data Journalism Awards competition. And this year, uh, we've received 630 entries coming from 58 different countries. That's a record, basically. Uh, we've never had that many from that many countries, so we are really, really happy with this outcome. And, um, the list of projects that came um, to us was pretty amazing, yet again. Um, out of these 630 entries, half of them came from large newsrooms, and the other half came from smaller newsrooms. Can I do something about this? Wait a second. So, um, the most popular categories for the competition were the data visualization of the year category and the investigation of the year category, um, which is often the most popular ones throughout the year, uh, we find. Tell me. Make it smaller. All right, I can do that. Hey, hey. Okay, that works, that works. So, we all know journalists hate deadlines, right? And this year, more than ever, over half of the entries that were submitted came right on deadline day. So, you remember the number, we, we got 630 entries, right, in total. We give folks like a good few months to put their applications together, but still they always wait until the last minute to do so. So today we are very proud to announce that out of the 630 entries that uh, we've received, um, 99 nominations um, were made for this year's shortlist. And together, they represent the best data-driven work that has been done in the past year. Um, and as you can see, across five continents. Each category got between 5 and 12 
uh, projects uh, shortlisted. So that's quite an even breakdown. And now the, the jury um, needs to decide who is going to win. And that's the tough part. Um, that will take place in the next few weeks. So you will um, need to wait and find out. Um, at the Data Journalism Awards ceremony, that will take place uh, at the end of May in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, during the Gen Summit 2018. Now, I can actually give you a closer look to um, the list of projects if you're interested. Yes. All right, all right. And there. Okay. So that web page is now live, officially. And um, as you can see, it does feature this um, lovely visualization we've just looked at that you can play with later if you'd like. And Simon, if you want to join me in taking turns. Uh, there you go, the data visualization of the year category. Got some fantastic people out there. Uh, some you probably know, some you may not have heard of yet. Um, but that's great. That gives you an opportunity to discover new projects, right? So um, the shortlisted projects for this category, Data Visualization of the Year, uh, come from Bayanat Box in Lebanon, um, BBC News Visual Journalism team in the UK, yay! Uh, <laughs> Bloomberg, um, uh, the Bureau in Hong Kong, uh, Kaising Media uh, in China, uh, Dojons Media in the US, Journalism Plus Plus Stockholm in Sweden, South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, SRF Data in Switzerland, uh, Thomson Reuters, the team based in Singapore, uh, the New York Times uh, in the US, the Washington Post also from the US, and Zeit Online in Germany. Okay, this next one. Uh, so investigation of the year is always another huge category. Um, we were really conscious when we were doing the shortlist. We wanted to have, make sure that people were represented from around the world. So we have 538, the gerrymandering project, uh, the violence monitor from G1 in Brazil, the Paradise Papers from the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, um, Malaya Siankini, thank you, Malaysia Kini, sorry, from the Philippines on um, their amazing project uh, looking at reporting deaths in police custody, Tampa Bay Times in the US, the zombie campaigns, campaign funding, uh, the Globe and Mail for Easy Money Project, and the Guardian US for its uh, homeless uh, project looking at the way people are being bussed out across the country. All right, next category, news data app of the year. Um, the shortlisted projects, Financial Times with the Uber game, um, 538 with the Atlas of redistricting, uh, Malaysia Kini with Undy Power, ProPublica with Trump Town, uh, the Wall Street Journal, with Build Your Own Trading Bot, and finally, We Do Data with Extrapol. So for entries for the Data Journalism website of the year, we have uh, represented here on the shortlist, La Nacion in Argentina for the data site, La Nacion in Costa Rica uh, for their election site, uh, Passmark from South Africa, from the Media Hack South Africa, um, Rappler in the Philippines, the Safer Roads Project, um, we've got Stateless in Brazil and the Wall Street Journal's data and graphics uh, team. The next category is the Child Bid Award for the best use of data in breaking news. And um, the shortlisted projects are uh, Bloomberg Graphics with five maps that show why Macron beat Le Pen. Um, the FT uh, in the UK with instant analysis of European elections. Um, the 538 team with North American hurricane coverage, La Nación in Argentina with the search operation of the submarine Ara San Juan, uh, and the Wall Street Journal with healthcare holdouts in the house. The next category is one I, I care a lot about, open data in data journalism. And um, again, we've got quite an interesting mix from around the world. We've got, uh, although three from the US, uh, 538 Open Data web page, La Nacion's Open Data Journalism for Change, uh, the New Jersey Advanced Media site on, on uh, death and dysfunction, which is a, a, a very 
good investor project, local project, We've got Post Media Canada, follow the money, and Stanford University's Open Policing Project. Okay. Um, the next one is uh, Best Individual Portfolio. And so the people shortlisted for this category are Chris Cannon from Bloomberg Graphics in the US, uh, Lam Chui Vo from BuzzFeed News in the US, Jonathan Albright uh, from the Tau Center, uh, Columbia University, uh, Julia Wolf from 538, uh, Abdul, Abdul Salam Afridi from New Zealand, Pakistan, uh, Yudivian Almeida from Post Data Club, uh, Patrick Stotz from Spiegel Online, Timo Krosenbacher from SRF Data, Mona Shalabi from The Guardian, and Rob Grant from Trinity Mirror Data Unit. So, um, for some categories we can split, uh, we want to recognize that big organizations have different resources to small organizations, and particularly that applies to data journalism teams. So, um, we have two, two groups here for the shortlisted project for the best data journalism team. For the larger organizations, we have AFP Interactive, uh, the BBC News Visual and Data Journalism team, Bloomberg Graphics, Kaijin VizLab 538, followed the Londrina from Brazil, the South China Morning Post, Associated Press, The Guardian, uh, the New York Times Opinion section, The Times and the Sunday Times data team, and Reuters Graphics. And for the small organization's um, best data journalism team category, the shortlisted um, teams are Sivio from Spain, um, Nunchalt's Code for Africa and Code for Nigeria, um, Especiales Data Sketch. Um, Info Times, Journalism Plus Plus Stockholm, um, DM, KRO NCRB, Data Journalism Team in Netherlands, um, how do you say that? NZ? NZ. <laughs> NZZ, Storytelling, sorry, from Switzerland, um, Monitor de Victimas um, from the Venezuela, and the Bureau Local from the TBIJ in the UK. A new category this year is innovation in data journalism. We're looking at teams that have done interesting stuff with new technology. So for this uh, shortlist of projects, we've got Road to Nowhere from the African Drone Project in South Africa, Hannah and Ishmael from the uh, BR Data and Spiegel Online in Germany, uh, Hidden Spy Planes from BuzzFeed in the US, Via Sobre, Sobre Costo from Convoca in Peru, Newsworthy for Journalism Plus Plus in Sweden again, uh, USA Today's Project on the Wall, VG Norway's project on neglected bridges and Zeit Online's project in urban rural prejudice. Next category is the Student and Young Data Journalist of the Year Award. Um, the shortlisted um, people for this category are Marie-Louise Timke from the Berliner Morgan Post, uh, Raphael Radkael Dottel from 538, Saimi Rice from Post Data Club, Agnel Philip from the Arizona Republic, Michael Hester from the Data Face, and Martin Gonzalez from The Economist in Spain. And finally. Yeah, and the last category is really a selection of the uh, shortlist projects which are voted on by the public from a representation from across the world. It's got the Nasson Data from Argentina, the New Jersey Advanced Media Project on Death's Dysfunction, Trump Town from ProPublica. Um, Bust Out from The Guardian, Monitor de Valencia from G1 in Brazil, Follow the Money from Post Media Canada, Undi Power from Malaysia, Unizing Data on the Syrian Conflict from the Bionet Box, Passmark from South Africa, uh, Rappler's Safer Roads Project, and Kaiju Media's Project on High Speed Rail. Great. So congratulations to everyone in the room who might be involved in some of the projects we've uh, mentioned in this shortlist. Um, congratulations to all of you for coming up to this session and taking part in some, you know, great discussions. And um, before we let you go, I can invite you to go and, and check the, the shortlist um, again on the website that is datajournalismawards.org slash shortlist. Thank you all. Have a very nice lunch break. <laughs> Keep in touch. You know, the discussion carries on, so have a great end of day. Cheers.